Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Assistant Speaker Catherine Clark and so honored to be joined by our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, today. Also want to thank Congresswoman Lori Trahan and my partner in Cambridge, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. And we are also joined by my former colleague in the State House and champion for Cambridge Health Alliance and access to health care and mental health care. Uh, Marjorie Decker. We're so pleased to be here. Uh, I think it is appropriate that in Women's History Month, uh, we are celebrating bold female leaders every <laughs> single day. Um, but really, we want to thank our host, Cambridge Health Alliance, and Dr. Saya. Um, we so appreciate you having us here. And more than that, the incredible work that you have done uh, over over decades, but really um, since this pandemic, uh, we appreciate your your featuring um, the the funding that came through the American Rescue Plan signed a year ago yesterday, and uh, appreciate your stories of how that's made a real difference here and in the communities we serve. So we're grateful to be here. And with that, Madam Speaker, I will turn it oh, over to me. You. Oh, okay. I hear the Thank you very much. Uh, Assistant Speaker Catherine <laughs> Clark, it's an honor to be here with you, with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, with Congresswoman Lori Trahan, and um, again with you, Madam Senator, in your capacity here. Doctor, thank you for the opportunity to be here at uh, Cambridge Health Alliance so we can discuss some things. And I'm particularly eager because the president last week in his State of the Union address said something where he wanted us to work in unity. He thought there could be common ground in four areas, four areas that you work in uh, too. Well, starting with mental health, and he went into more detail about that. And thank you for your leadership in that regard. He also talked about helping our veterans and the mental health issue comes into play there. He talked about uh, opioids, uh, just putting an end to that, as well as his moonshot of cancer. Uh, so again, because the, ment because the mental health issue has been something where we have really got to do something so transformative, so different from before. Some other things need to be incrementally increased, but the mental health issue has to be transformational and all of that. So that's why I was particularly interested in some, to hearing about what you're um, all up to here and in any other uh, aspect of this. Uh, we're very proud of what we did in the ARP, uh, the uh, um, American Rescue Plan, where we transferred, we got people Medicaid onto a um, Affordable Care Act, many more people signing up, so many things in there, and some of that in the continued in the uh, n other legislation that hasn't passed yet, but we fully <coughs> intend to do. There's so many other things. But I thought we'd start with where we, the president hopes that we would have unity uh, that you, we can learn so much from you about. So thank you. Thank you. And, and truly, truly, it's an honor. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Madam Speaker. And, and thank you very much, uh, Assistant Speaker uh, Clark, really for, for uh, choosing the Cambridge Health Alliance as a time to really spend time with us and have a conversation about where do we need to go. Uh, it's, it's been a tremendous partnership with with all the support uh, from Congressman Presley and the work that uh, Congressman Trahan has done, and our uh, state uh, uh, delegation, uh, truly with with the partnership with uh, uh, Representative Decker, amazing work uh, in support of the work that we've done in here. It is it is an honor being here on on the uh, anniversary of signing of the American. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it's amazing work. And, and this work has been truly instrumental and critical in maintaining access and maintaining our ability to care for our patient population throughout the last two years and moving forward. Uh, uh, starting with the CARES Act, which was very helpful for us as a safety net organization and the support that we got. And even before that, through the support uh, through our uh, state and federal partnership, I remember calling uh, Congresswoman Presley's office uh, early in the pandemic asking for masks and gowns and gloves and, and and the response was absolutely tremendous 
At one point, we only had three days worth of gloves on hand. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to be able to provide this kind of work in a safe environment for our patient population. So it's not only the funding, it's also the critical support at the time that we needed it the most. Uh, we are at a critical juncture right now, at a time when we all have to make bold action both uh, at a regional and statewide and a national level to be able to pivot in an area and make a difference moving forward, to your point, to very critical areas. Starting with, to, to, to uh, uh, President Biden's points, really, the, the list is absolutely on the mark uh, and hitting the areas that we need to focus on. But today, we're going to focus a little bit more on healthcare and, and to your point, uh, behavioral health. And as an organization, uh, this is our history and this is our mission. And this is a commitment that we made many, many years ago in the sense of our existence as the only public hospital in the state. Uh, we are the only public health care organization in Massachusetts. And to that, we do hold a specific place. Now, there are a lot of safety net organizations in here, but we're the only public hospital organization. And the work that the, the, uh, uh, the federal government has done to really support us uh, has been instrumental in maintaining our mission and our ability to serve the most vulnerable safety net population in the state. Uh, our population, particularly to the north, was the hardest, earliest hit population during the pandemic. Right. And it's a, uh, the population that still requires a lot of support up until today. And our mission is out there for the community and has always been in the community. Talking about behavioral health, uh, we made a commitment very early to really address some of the issues statewide. And we just talked about the Somerville Hospital uh, that a year ago, uh, with support of the state and the federal government and, and ourselves, uh, scratching every dollar we have to really reopen the hospital that was truly mothballed in 2009. Uh, and turn it back into a uh, state-of-the-art center of excellence pediatric psychiatric facility with 69 beds, inpatient beds, that also include specialty care for autistic kids, for neurobehavioral kids, uh, child and adolescent, mm -hmm. also work on inpatient and outpatient care. By the time it's open in the next few months, we will be the largest pediatric inpatient psychiatric health care provider in the state. So this is great project we need to do. Amazing, amazing. I'm reading your signs behind you. <laughs> this, this is the design for the hospital that we just yeah. talked about. Yeah. 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 So with the construction is well on its way. We should be opening in the next few months. And actually this week we'll be opening our first unit. So that's uh, the, that's the adolescent that. psychiatric unit. Yeah, which, which is, which is huh? uh, that's yeah. It's awesome. a mile and a half from here. Yeah. Sure. Um, just... Uh, when we were taking the photo downstairs and I said uh, to the speaker, should we say, you know, for the people, because that's what informs everything that we do. And incidentally, uh, Madam Speaker, if you didn't see that there, uh, sort of care to the people, is there? <laughs> <laughs> that's a different motto. But uh, the speaker said, no, the children, the children, the children, because that is her refrain uh, for everything. And top three priorities. Yes, top three priorities, the children, the children, the children. And, um, I know that is certainly true for um, our assistant speaker and Congresswoman Tran and Representative Decker and, and, and all of you. Um, the issue of childhood trauma in particular is an issue that I, I led on the council and since in, in Congress, uh, you know, did um, the first uh, hearing on childhood trauma in the Oversight Wonderful. Committee under Chairman Cummings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I continue to be very concerned that although we have made great strides in combating the pandemic, that the second pandemic will be trauma. Mm -hmm. will be um, mental and behavioral health challenges, particularly for 140,000 uh, children, disproportionately black and brown, who have lost a parent, a grandparent, or a caregiver uh, during this, this pandemic. And so, you know, the greatest wealth of our commonwealth is the health of our people, and, and certainly um, our most vulnerable. And so uh, we just thank you for what you're doing, and it's very heartening to learn how you have used these funds from the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan, because it makes it tangible and real for us. What really is the, uh, the acute and generational impact of these unprecedented investments? Um, I do have um, just uh, two quick questions, and we don't have to do them now. I'll wait, because <laughs> I want to talk to you know, just to say something, so, but I'll wait. But just, you know, very happy to be here and just, um, 
the role that you play is such, is such a critical one, and, and we're um, uh, in your debt. Pleasure. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, to be sure, I'm here to listen to you in terms of how we can further support uh, what you're all doing on the front lines and what you've so valiantly done in the last two years. I just want to hug you and your whole team. <laughs> um, I represent uh, community hospitals like Lawrence General, Lowell General, and uh, and they the surge has never let up, right? That's a safety net hospital. 60% of the Lawrence population has been diagnosed with COVID. So if you can just imagine on the ground, those hospitals are stressed well past their limit. And the ARPA funds have been lifelines for community hospitals, but we know that you're just getting started on dealing with the aftermath. And so happy to hear um, about what you're investing in child and adolescent uh, uh, inpatient psychiatry, uh, psychiatric help. Um, and just want to know how we can be a resource to you as you sort of embark on what will be a crisis after the pandemic. Thank you. We came to listen. <laughs> came to listen. And, uh, you know, um, just thank you again. We know that we are on a very tight schedule because our speaker is amazing and packs more into one day than most of us do in a week. Tell them so. they closed the Washington Airport. That's why I went for one hour and then we had to de ice and then we had to get in line. And so everything is later. But doesn't make it any less uh, urgent yeah, for us to hear from you. We appreciate you. every moment. Hear from yeah. you. Uh -huh. and as, and, yeah, you know, just as my colleague said, we'd love to hear about how how the behavioral health crisis, especially for young people and children, is is showing up, and how ARPA has helped you meet this need. So let me ask the clinicians on the front line to yeah. tell us the stories. Yeah, and then we can build on that story on Wonderful. how that work from a logistical point of view and, and support point of view, where we can go from here. That's okay. Wonderful. So um, it, we are definitely in a dire situation here. Um, the influx of patients, especially the youth that are um, in our emergency departments, mm -hmm. is overwhelming, to say the least, alongside mm -hmm. caring for the COVID patients that are still coming. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen that the struggles of the pandemic have given the children and the adolescents, they have no bandwidth to tolerate not one more stressor. And so they're showing up in the emergency department. They're here for days. They're here for hours. Um, we've seen um, any month, any given day, any given month, we see between 50 and 25 and 50 adolescents and children boarding, which means they're there for days. Um, we have in February, we had uh, the median waiting time for an inpatient placement was four and a half days. Oh As last week, we had a young adolescent that was here for 353 um, hours, which is 15 days. Wow. Um, it's, it's just dire, a dire, dire situation, and anything you can do to help would be much appreciated. Thank you. Just, just uh, you know, our um, our service is really a regional service um, because we really try to, um, as Dr. Said said, really uh, provide care for the Commonwealth as far as we can. Um, so we always keep an eye on the on the Commonwealth numbers as well, and we have. Um, the, the, the Massachusetts Hospital Association does a survey that a number of uh, hospitals take part in. Um, and like this past Monday, there were 650 patients waiting for services in the Commonwealth just on that Monday. Um, and of those, there were 200 children. Um, and, uh, you know, we see, we see frequently kids who wait for months in, um, in emergency rooms or other facilities. Um, Dr. Say and I was just involved in a patient very recently that's been in another facility for three months um, before we were able to take the patient. So it is really, uh, it's really very difficult. Imagine being a parent and sitting in the emergency room and you know, the child's life is on hold for that time. Um, there's, there's really nothing happening in the emergency room. Uh, Jamie knows how difficult it is to keep the kids engaged. So it, it is really a difficult situation. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can make some impact with more beds. Uh, but it really, that's not the only answer. It's really how can we be innovative and how can we 
really do some other preventive work as well, which is incredibly important in this regard. Can you tell us about the impact that you see on the inpatient unit and how these patients that are waiting for such a long time, mm. what do you see in, in post -care? Sure. You know, in the inpatient setting, it's striking. We have children between 3 and 17 years old who have been waiting in the ERs for extraordinarily long periods of time. And just that length of disruption to normal developmental routines when you're already in a crisis, so you already have the disruption of the pandemic, and then you have the added disruption of this time waiting for care. Mm. You know, we have seen a level of severity of symptomatology on the unit just you know, the multiple effects of stressors kind of combined on top of our pre-existing vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. it shows up in tremendous aggression, tremendous desperation, uh, depression, self-injurious behavior, and the level of dysregulation, you know, each child has their own picture, and then they all come together. And so in the unit, you're experiencing just this mm -hmm wildfire of pain and suffering and the predominant presentation is that of trauma always has been well before the pandemic mm -hmm. and to see that sort of multiply tenfold over by sort of the impoverishing of social determinants of health that we all know are so critical mm -hmm. but just the deepening of those cracks mm -hmm. in the pandemic and then the sort of disproportionate deepening between our most marginalized populations mm -hmm. Um, it's been incredibly painful to bear while trying to provide as much care as you can in, in all the PPE with all of the effort that you can muster. Sure. Yeah. One question I have, I sit on the healthcare subcommittee and the energy and commerce committee, and certainly, you know, how you get at this problem is going to be very important to you know, solving it. Could you talk to me maybe about some of the workforce issues. We know that it's hard enough just to retain the folks who have gone through these past two years, never mind attract new folks to the profession. And there are certain levers like loan forgiveness programs and incentives, but I'm curious just to hear you talk about the workforce uh, challenges as we need to ramp up uh, services for young people. The workforce challenges are are enormous um, and, and you know it's not only numbers of people it's not just how do you educate and and support the education and you know learn for you. those things are incredibly important and very helpful but it's not a, a, the numbers help it is the the em, emotional drain that on people who have to deal with this day in and day out on top of their own trauma in their own communities during COVID as well. So, you know, the, we, we went through a period with, with, you know, when COVID started and then we had, you know, George Floyd. It, it was just so much trauma that was happening to everybody during that time. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, really, I'm at a bit of a loss to how do we get to the emotional support for our staff? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's going to be so important because if you are not in a good space, how can you take care of this very, very difficult kids. So, I mean, the, the loan forgiveness is very important. I think, you know, we are, the way that some um, areas are designated, you know, we have maybe some physicians who want J1 waivers, mm -hmm. but they can't necessarily get them because of the designation of the area. Uh, you know, so there's all these kind of uh, issues that I think uh, Congress can maybe help help us in terms of addressing as well um, just to keep you know we train good people and then if they're on a J1 they have to leave so you know it, it, it really would be helpful to to look at that you know and also just uh, support for our own trainees who, who really go through medical school and it's so expensive yeah. and you have you know all the other training that and the years of not good income you know and then you know, we live in Boston, it's very expensive. So, you know, how do we help them and how can we support them as well? I think it would be incredibly important. I would, I would add to that um, the importance of support at all levels, uh, not only to the professionals, but at all levels. And this is a two-way street because uh, on one hand, we need to really widen the pipeline. And on the other hand, at the same time, we need to support the communities for growth, for access 
for opportunities mm -hmm. uh, at home where the community is. This is a lot of work that we're doing out there. Uh, building relationships with schools, with high schools, mm -hmm. with trade uh, uh, schools, uh, with the communities being out there uh, through community workers uh, that look sound like the people that they're working with. And yeah. That's very important in the future, yeah. and so all in this, particularly in healthcare. Yeah. And we need to move in that direction. There's no question about it, because building trust is absolutely critical moving forward. And that's the way that we slowly build that level of trust. Yeah. That was actually my question, um, just building off of what the Congresswoman offered um, uh, regarding workforce and just uh, retention and uh, their own life stressors and, and mental health. But, you know, how are you meeting children in community? What sort of partnerships do you have with schools? But then also, how do we address not only what is going to be a growing, even though it already existed before, but it's been exacerbated workforce shortage, but also um, really struggling around a representation and having that uh, that cultural experience, uh, competency and shared lived experience. And so, you know, I'm not sure how, how we get at that, the pipeline. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. I, I have the also honor to also be, in addition to being the CEO, the, the Commissioner of Public Health for the City of Cambridge. So my work is not only limited to the hospital, but being out there, uh, providing care, providing support, providing oversight uh, to Cambridge. And we do have also a very close relationship with the other departments for all the communities that we serve, all the 10 communities that we serve. But to your point, um, we are at a point right now, and I think it's not going to be too miraculous to change the, the, the culture. Uh, it is creating that level of trust at the community, at the home, and that support, whether it is through churches or, or house of faith or through uh, uh, organizations that are embedded in the community or through schools. Mm -hmm. uh, by being the, in our nature, we actually provide uh, the, the school healthcare support for all our communities. So we do have the school nurses, uh, the teen clinics, and we support them and, and staff them. Uh, and we have to start early at all levels, providing that education and that enlightenment uh, at the home for all the youth to say, there is an opportunity outside the limited environment that I'm exposed to in healthcare. I can be a doctor. I can be a, 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 a CEO. Yeah. And that is very important to start that, those ideas early. Yeah. Um, we had a, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, a, a conversation with Dr. Okudutu, who really produced the, the movie uh, 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 Black Men in White Coats. And really he speaks to the point on how did he get exposed to the idea of becoming a physician early in his youth. Mm -hmm. And what do we need to do to really stay to the to young people out there at early age that this is a possibility and you have to really think big. Yeah. Uh, thinking big too late is, is too late. You have to start thinking big very young. Yeah. I was fortunate to have that infused in me by my parents. I, I wasn't born in the United <laughs> States. And I went through my own uh, trial and tribulation to get to where I am today. Yeah. But really thinking big was something very important. Well, Dr. Saya, we appreciate you thinking big <laughs> and all of you for not just caring for our patients, but really caring for the community. And uh, thank you for your advocacy. We need our state partners and- It's not uh, state partners. This. Yes, yeah. our, our representative, Marjorie, Marjorie Decker, <laughs> but we know the speaker um, is getting from this event. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Madam Speaker, thank you. I, I just want to say thank you for being here and for the extra time. As somebody who's chair of the Committee on Mental Health and Substance Use, and now I'm the chair of the Public Health Committee, work really closely with our safety net hospital here. And I know we are so lucky to have the Massachusetts delegation. Thank you for empowering them to be in the positions that they're in. Um, we know the common denominator for behavioral health and mental health issues is economic security. Right? So you're already leading the charge with this incredible delegation. The more people can meet their basic financial needs of their family, you actually see a reduction in the urgent care of mental health and behavioral health. Um, we also need to continue integrating behavioral health into our healthcare system. Every acute hospital should be required to actually provide mental health. Any urgent care center should be required to have 24 hours of this. Um, the waiting list for children who are stuck in emergency rooms I was able to get a, 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 an amendment passed that now allows the Department of Mental Health to put up a dashboard. So any day we can now see how many children are stuck in emergency rooms without care. 
if we ensure that those hospitals that they're in are provided the whole rate um, that is on parity with um, non-behavioral health, they can offer them the services even if it's not the appropriate placement. And I'll just say, I'll leave it at this. We would not allow a child to sit in a bed with a broken arm or a bleeding wound and think that they can wait four days or 15 days and often weeks and just say that we'll get there. And that is what we do with children in need of behavioral health care. Um, and I just want to say again, we have an incredible delegation at the congressional level. I'm so grateful. And two of them actually represent my district. <laughs> I'm so super lucky. Never let it takes go. both of us to keep up with yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the world. And thank you for your incredible leadership. And we are so fortunate to have um, Dr. Saya and this incredible team who I get to work with on policy and on care. So thank you for making this important enough to you to be here. Well, thank you. I appreciate your saying that. We we have had challenges in in terms of uh, disparities within our healthcare system throughout. Uh, the decision that the president has made is about equity and justice in everything that we do, whether it's building infrastructure or environmental justice or whatever it is, but in all of this as well. And the members that you acknowledge, and I thank you for sending them uh, to the Congress, have been an important part of how we subject the challenge that was revealed. We sort of knew, but there was no denying after seeing the, uh, how the pandemic hit, that we were not, that, that, that it hit places disproportionately, black, brown, whatever, and, uh, uh, and again, revealed what was should have been self-evident, but was clear to anybody uh, who cared to know the truth that we had to address these issues in a culturally, linguistically appropriate, appropriate way, and that um, if anything less than that was a disservice. The issue, other issue, is money, and we have to think in a bigger way about mental health. It's a phys it's it's health. You know, it's like what are we talking about? Um, but um, in that vein, the, um, the, I think that the public is ready to understand that health care is health care in every aspect uh, of it. But um, when we're talking about our safety net hospitals, we really have to be thinking in a very substantial way. And the good news for me is, as I listen to the providers and we try to get more provider money, many of the hospitals have said, take care of the, the safety net hospitals first. We all need money. They absolutely must have the resources. So we may have to call upon you uh, to uh, <laughs> reach out to others to make sure yep. that they know that that's part of the, shall we say, prioritizing that we have to do. They don't even want to, some of the in Congress don't want to do any provider money. And, and because they take the most substantial institution and say they don't need it. No, we're not talking about them. We're talking about the rest. And, and again, as Congresswoman Presley mentioned, from the earliest time, whether it's STEM, the science part of STEM, to get kids early into that loop, uh, so, so very, very important. So, uh, I'm in awe of what you do, all of you. Thank you so much um, to uh, to you, of course, Doctor, to Janine. Well, Matt, call you Janine. <laughs> to Janine, <laughs> Janine, and, and uh, to Doctor Venter and Doctor Meta, and to you, Representative uh, Decker. Thank you so much. Do any uh, other comments? I mean, are you? Can this is know? awesome. What you're doing. Is, I mean, you have really taken it to where it needs to go and now we all have to recognize that we need to do more yeah. for you. And, and really thank you for the recognition and, and really taking the time to, to listen because this is absolutely important. Yeah. Uh, as you listen to us, we listen to our constituents, constituents out there and that's very important and I can tell you the support that we've had from Assistant Speaker Clark and Congresswoman Presley and Congresswoman Trahan and, and all our delegation mm -hmm. has been amazing. Uh, one of the things that I want to mention in here, moving forward, as we think about how, about safety net, is the support, really the recognition that the safety net organizations have, uh, have over the years have left so far behind. 
and infrastructure and ability and support and our willing people. Because every year, those safety net hospitals have worked so hard to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been able to invest as what we needed to invest with infrastructure. And to be honest with you, the building that, that you walked in is 75 years old. Mm -hmm. And we do have a building in Everett that's over 100 years old. And we still work very hard to use that facility to care for patients. But there's a level of equity in here that is absolutely critical. And the patient population that we serve deserves the same as everybody else. We will do our best to do what we can to provide that care. And our quality metrics are as good as anybody else, if not better than most of the Boston teaching hospitals and the patient satisfaction experience is there. But at some point, it's hard to go to Daytona 500 with a Model T. And that's what we have today. Yeah. And we need to be able to be able to modernize the facilities that we have because those patients deserve the same. Well, as you ended, you've given us a path because what you're talking about modernizing, whether we're talking about technologically, ventilation-wise, uh, in so many other different ways, uh, we have to show the people you serve the respect they deserve and the respect they see when they come to a place that is not substandard in, in any way. And I would apply that to classrooms yeah. as well as yeah. uh, yeah. schools yeah. as well as, as hospitals. So again, the, uh, the rapid change in technology, ventilation, all these kinds of things, water systems, everything, uh, we have to put our hand in every pocket that's coming down. <laughs> to, to your point, Madam Speaker, we actually, our, our main facility that we've historically cared for outpatient psychiatry in some of them has been closed because of the ventilation system. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost like $12 million to upgrade the vent. We cannot have patients in there. No, you can't. So, it, it, and it's, we do what we can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do a tremendous job. Thank you so much, Dr. Saya, to all our healthcare providers. Um, we, we are with you because you have been with us and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. And that is just may, ma'am, can you just, Janine, talk about the need for more nurses? <laughs> so, Janine. <laughs> we definitely need more nurses. Um, I feel the generations um, have kind of gone away from nursing, even though we're rather well respected. Um, they think of nursing more as kind of a stepping stone to the the bedside nurse or the inpatient nurse is more of a stepping stone to be in primary care and uh, plastic surgery as an NP or whatever. Um, Cambridge Health Alliance has been very, um, we're very proud. We've done um, emergency department specific res nurse residency programs where we've had a pretty um, successful uh, graduation and retainment okay. until the last few months where you know, the travel nursing business has kind of swayed them away, but they'll be back, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and I, I just, it's its not just nurses, it's techs, yeah. mm -hmm. it's housekeepers. Yeah. It's a whole support. It's dietary team. help. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's a lot of people have um, nothing left to give. So, do, you, do you feel like that's going to be permanent? Or do you feel like it'll be temporary break and folks will come back? Or should we be, how should we be thinking about that problem? I feel, um, I feel like it's permanent. Thank you. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, people are broken. The, yeah. the, anybody who works in healthcare is, mm -hmm. at this point in time, they're broken. Mm -hmm. And we come to work every day, we do the best we can. Um, it's hard to get through till 10 o'clock in the morning and then you take a breath and then you get through till three o'clock in the afternoon. and. Um, and, um, because patients that are coming are frustrated and angry, they've been, you know, they're out of work and they can't see their primary care doctors. Yeah. It's, it's a very specifically to the emergency department. And I would say inpatient and in psychiatry, everybody, um, is feeling beaten up and mm -hmm. they've, um, on the edge of not having it anymore. Mm -hmm. Janine mentioned the word time at the end of her, yes, at the end of her life. <laughs> And Doc, you mentioned time at the beginning of your remarks about the time and urgency and the time it took and how old some things are. So uh, it's about time for us to do much more <laughs> about it. And we'll be better equipped with the basis of what you are telling us and what you're hearing from your patients, which is 
very valuable as well. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no, no. I, I love the nurse. I have eight thousand nurses in my district, or at least I used to, <laughs> and they're my bosses. So I. <laughs> you love all as they should too. be. <laughs> Many thanks again. We so appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Madam so Speaker. Thank you very much for being here.